As time goes on, we theory crafters continue to puzzle over the many mysteries of the world of Tevat. Sometimes we strike gold, other times we're driven to madness while grasping at straws. At other times, we're more content to simply revisit and recontextualize things we've already spent years staring at. It's not every day that new information comes floating down from the heavens to enlighten us, and even then, we often have reasons to doubt our conclusions, or just not enough information to be sure. Sometimes the most tinfoil hat theories just miss entirely. Other times, they remain ambivalent, floating out there in the theory-crafting ether like a hungry celestial space whale waiting for its chance to resurface. But every now and then, the Hoyoverse gives us something parallel that's just too clear to pass up. Sure, any theory might end up being wrong, every gamble is a risk, but for me, the joy of theory-crafting is seated in making connections and in chapter 40 and onward of Honkai Impact 3rd, something came up that was just too clear and too specific to ignore. This chapter introduced us to a lonely, rogue planet on the outskirts of our galaxy, cut off from the outside. This is a little world cultivated by a self-made god using stolen technology, a captured spaceship called the Ark. Overseen by seven overseers who are clones of the one who cultivated and seeded life on this planet. And if that sounds pretty familiar, well, I thought so too. I'm Ganymede, the persistent scribe of the Hexen Circle, and today I'll be your guide to the planet Chimi, the people involved with it, and their significance in Honkai Impact 3rd, as well as the possible influence they might have in the world of Tevat. I'm giving a giant disclaimer here also, please don't take any of my extrapolation and connections here as me asserting it as canon fact. This is one of the more out there ideas I've looked at in recent days, and I'm focusing on pointing out the connections and the parallels more than I'm ever going to say, oh I've solved the origin of Tibet. Again, as someone who loves Hong Kong Impact 3rd dearly, and has come to know the lore relatively well, I want to present the information to fans of the other Hoyoverse games in a way that makes sense, despite all of the wibbly wobbly tiny whiny in between areas. There may always be places that, despite my research, I haven't understood completely as well. Basically, let's just grow and expand our brains a little bit today. Next, of course, the usual blanket spoiler warnings. It's hard to be mindful sometimes about what exactly I'm spoiling because I can and will pull from any and all current quests in Genshin and Honkai. When I say current, that is 4.2 in Genshin and the end of 7.1 in Honkai Impact. You've been warned. One last disclaimer of note, while Honkai Star Rail and Genshin both have meticulously maintained wiki pages where any information and text divulge can be searched up for quick reference, Honkai Impact 3rd's pages are not nearly so well sourced, so I have to do a lot of my revisiting of things through literal scene rewatches and my own hastily scribbled notes from my own initial playthrough. I am running out of notebooks. Anyway, let's get started. This story begins with our brave heroine, Fu Hua, a survivor of the previous era, aged a tender 50,000 years, arriving in a strange bubble universe that she has no knowledge of. She quickly learns that the city she's arrived in is called Phosphorus, and is overseen by seven city representatives known as the Vitas. They are all Vita, but each has a color and personality attribute assigned to them in order to differentiate them. Two of the seven are male, but the other... The only obvious way to tell them apart is that their hair is slightly shorter than that of their sisters. Fu Hua quickly notes that the name of the city in her native tongue would be Qi Ming. Hua then finds out that this world is unique from any that she's ever been to before in the fact that they are relatively developed as a civilization, but have never seen Honkai beasts or disasters manifest that they know of. The Honkai has only appeared to infest this world shortly after her arrival. Hua works quickly to protect the citizens. She's been a defender of humanity, keeping a silent vigil for millennia, so this is par for the course for her. Hua's investigation quickly leads her to gaining the trust of the seven overseers, 
and they let her be privy to some of the city's secrets. The first of these is the so-called museum, full of bizarre artifacts and curios brought to Qi Ming by the overseer's overseer, the big sis Vita, a clone of the god who captured and made use of this small planet for her own devices, but that's a subject for later. Citizens are not allowed to enter the museum, and even for the Vitas, it's not a place they feel that they're allowed to enter. In fact, they only do so because one of them felt they ought to keep it clean from dust. The second secret is the nearby city ruins they call Hesperus, which Hua named Chang'eng. Qiming and Chang'eng are both Chinese words for the planet Venus. In modern day, it's called Jingxing. This is a hint to the fact that the world was given this name by its creator, who is the lone survivor of an ancient and highly advanced civilization from Venus, called Purusha by its people, that was destroyed. The civilization of Purusha was destroyed by the original Cocoon of Finality, but they called the cause of their impending apocalypse the Abyss. They sought to defeat this calamity by triggering a tsunami in the Sea of Quanta. This washed away the Cocoon, but also destroyed their world, leaving only one survivor, Vita who became the god Saw. Vita as a character is fascinating and exists as a facsimile of this concept of samsara in the Honkai universe. She was born as Vita and lived much like the bygone heroes of the main story's fallen past heroes in the time of her world's apocalypse. Over the course of millions of years, she became a presence not unlike the Cocoon of Finality, said to have the same abilities and functions but on a much smaller scale of power. She became the god Saw, only to end up creating a clone of her younger self that she claimed to despise because she was so much like the human self that Saw abandoned. Saw is her own samsara cycle just as she imposes one on the planet of Chi Ming. This little planet that she captured serves as a testing ground where Saw now recreates the self-same Honkai tragedy that her people suffered, but with one purpose to recreate a race of humans that would serve as appropriate vessels for the uploaded data of the consciousness of the Perusians. She has, from within the abyss in the Sea of Quanta, been hunting and devouring other worlds, using that energy to continue to fuel her maddened cyclical experiment that never seems to meet her expectations. Each cycle, her clone, and the seven childlike aspects of her humanity that she installed as the city's overseers must watch a civilization rise, only for Saw to inevitably judge it as a failure and destroy it again. It is important to note that, for all intents and purposes, the sky of Qi Ming is fake. Everything that makes the planet fully habitable is created by Saw and the energy that she farms by consuming other civilizations throughout the galaxy. The mechanism she uses to do this is wishes. There is a sequence where the player controls Saw as she visits Qi Ming, judging the citizens to be petty and evil, all of them bound by common mortal woes and avarices, unsuitable to her purposes, unsuitable for life. It's at this point that Hua, accompanied by the little Vitas, who are less agents of their creator and more sentient aspects of the personality that Saw cast off in order to become an omnipotent god, to Chang'eng, which is forbidden to them. The reason for this is that the ruins of Chang'eng contain the secret to Saw's ability to seed life and recreate her little mini-civilization over and over. That secret is the Lost Project Ark, created by Vilvi and Mobius, of the Flame Chasers. 50,000 years ago, they lost the battle against Honkai on Earth, but created many different contingency plans. Project Ark was one of their most ambitious. It was sent out into the cosmos with Griseo aboard, who went to countless worlds in the galaxy and, in some cases, seeded life on them using the human genome stored within and her own unique metamorph abilities. At some point after its second departure from Earth, Saw captured the Ark and pulled it into Qi Ming's orbit, causing it to crash. Where it fell became the so-called Forbidden Ground, where citizens and the Seven Little Vita overseers were forbidden from treading. Along the way, the protagonists faced interference from Moriarty, a clone of Auto Apocalypse that had been considered defective and gained sentience. 
Yeah, that one's a long story, but there are so many autoclones walking around, just don't worry about it. Basically, he considers Fu Hua to be his greatest rival and just exists to be a general annoying canker on anything she does. But this meddling doesn't stop our heroes from finding the truth. Fu Hua finds Griseo where she's been kept in her cryo sleep pod as prisoner for millennia and frees her old friend, finding the young girl as she last saw her to now be a full-fledged adult having grown out of her childish tendencies. All this despite having spent her entire adolescence alone in space, meeting the people of countless civilizations. She even encountered a solar system where the local sentient life were Honkai beasts with wills of their own. Despite still never finding that needle in a haystack, Hail Mary world they were searching for where there was no Honkai, until being crash landed on Qingning. In the end, the seven overseers give up their authorities, each one having a key with a gem correlating to the color of their authority, to allow Fu Hua and Griseo to face Saw, along with the Vita clone she made that has now chosen to break free from the yoke of her mad creator. They defeat this entity, with Vita inheriting the eyes of Bodhi that she likely stole from Sue, another flame chaser who encountered her upon his death when sinking to the bottom of the Sea of Quanta. This all left only one question. How had Fu Hua found herself in this strange place to begin with? That answer, too, came from Sue, their old comrade, whom Hua called her brother, along with Kevin. The four of them had been the only flame chasers to survive the apocalypse, joined by the hardship and deep bonds of camaraderie. Though Sue's physical body was in fact dead, his soul was not a normal human soul, having been made something much more powerful by his metamorph. In life, Sue's metamorph surgery, which all flame chasers had undergone, fused him with the Honkai beast Mahama Yuri, named for the sacred peacock of wisdom, and gave him immensely powerful psychic abilities. Now that he seems to occupy the place in the abyss where Saw had become a deity, he can use his powers from that space without interference, though he is only able to directly interact people who know he exists, which can be a bit of a roadblock. All the same, he used his newfound godlike power to project Fu Hua's soul to this tiny, far-flung world, specifically with the intention to rescue their surrogate little sister Griseo from Saw's clutches. It was a net positive that they also freed the people of Qi Ming from a terrible forced samsara cycle and basically furthered peace and goodness in the universe. Su now serves as a golden thread, able to connect the people of Qi Ming and Earth. And of course, Griseo, who is still marooned there to the people she left behind. In the ending of the story, he's shown happily serving as the communication link, not only for those he knew personally, but nearly the entire cast of characters. I like to interpret this as meaning that now that Hua and the others know the conditions of his ability to interfere and help, relies on them knowing of his existence or having been touched by it, that the story of the flame chasers on Earth will now become a story told and shared by all, no longer relegated to a lost past. Okay, so, this was a very condensed version of events touching on key points of the story that I personally found deeply important. I've left things out here and there that just weren't relevant or would take way too long to explain, but I hope the tale was at least engaging enough for you. That said, I'm sure you're wondering why I felt the need to just recount the latest leg of the Honkai Impact 3rd Saga to you before even starting this theory, and well, let's start with the names Hesperus and Phosphorus, translated by Fu Hua as Qi Ming and Chong En. If the words Hesperus and Phosphorus seem familiar, they should. Especially if you're like me and have been fascinated by Enkonomiya and its lore since the beginning. The one other place we hear these words in the wider Hoyaverse is indeed in Genshin Impact. Enkonomiya is where we first become really clearly aware of this idea of history repeating itself and being hidden away from the sight of the average individual. And I've just recounted a tale that boils down to sound startlingly familiar. What was the story of Saw other than the story of a god who came from another world to a small one in primordial chaos and remade it for their own purposes? 
She split her original personality into seven overseers, each with a throne of authority, and those overseers were innocent, perfectly sentient beings who loved the people that they were left to watch over without a hint of knowledge of their creator's true intent. The world was locked in a brutal repeating cycle where the people of the world would be born, live, and suddenly die in a terrible and cataclysmic flood. Reenacting the tsunami from the Sea of Quanta that wiped clean the world of Purusha and its civilization. It's starting to sound pretty familiar, right? So, Hesperus and Phosphorus are quite literally the Greek versions of the concept of the evening and morning star. One such case where the Chinese terms Hua introduced are actually direct literal translations. This idea of Venus being both the evening and morning star, depending on time of year, location, etc., is one actually shared across countless civilizations, so it was a very cool way to draw such a parallel. We encounter the names Hesperus and Phosphorus in Economia in Genshin Impact right alongside Kairos, their name for Istaroth, one of the primordial one's shades. Though it's not a direct one-to-one -one through line, I feel like it's not an accident to invoke these two specific words when the Hoyaverse threw this little bubble world at us, as if to lampshade and directly reference the fact that Tevat's prehistory is full of Greek terms. And honestly, I'll never forget seeing the cutscenes for this area for the first time I played through. They are done, rather than in Honkai Impact's usual style, in the storybook style that's used in Genshin Impact, and it includes countless visual references, including the eight-pointed star that appears everywhere in Genshin, associated with both Conria and the Hexen Circle itself. In Economia, there are three achievement sets, as there are in any area, for time trials, guiding sealies, and for opening treasure chests. The awarded achievements are Kairos' Constancy, Phosphorus' Guidance, and Hesperus' Boons, respectively. Kairos is the name we're most familiar with, as it's the old Ekonomian name for Istaroth, Tokuyo Okami, the Thousand Winds, etc. Kairos is the ancient Greek word meaning the right, critical, or opportune moment. This was clearly referenced in the Byakuya Koku collection description of Istaroth as such, which describes her as the moment. It's all but confirmed, barring some big upset, that she is one of the primordial ones for shades. Fontaine's glider lore confirmed that one of the other shades was the Shade of Life, further lending credence to the widely researched and largely agreed upon theory that the shades of the primordial one are represented by the forms that the artifacts we equip in-game take. The Flower of Life, Sands of Eon, Circlet of Logos, etc. Those three would obviously correlate to the Shades of Life, Istaroth as the Goddess of Time, and the Crown likely represents the Primordial One themselves. The Goblet, likely Space or Void according to the Chinese character used, and Death are still missing. Maybe Death will make an appearance or cameo in that land, the Land of War? We all know that the gods each have many names, but it would be interesting if Hesperus and Phosphorus being included back in Enconomia might be references to Kairos' fellow shades. That's the most obvious conclusion to draw, as there's no real confirmation otherwise as to what the use of those names mean within the lore of Genshin. Why else would they be associated with Istaroth when there are no other gods in Enconomia aside from Orobashi after his arrival? This would come off to me as a superficial connection if not for the fact that nearly everything in the Honkai Impact third story I just retold didn't also have pretty firm connections to the microcosm of Tevat. There are other words that appear in Enkonomia that are prominent in Honkai Impact third, as well as Hyperion, which is the name of the main battleship the Valkyries use, Ouroboros, which I deal detailed in my recent video about the nature of Tevat's world structure, if not only for its connections to Honkai Impact Third's Dr. Mobius, but to Daneslave himself, and several other small references. Of course, not every reused Greek word is going to be a connection. Greek mythology is probably the most referenced mythos in all of fiction. The Hoyoverse tends to be pretty meticulous in what they choose to use and where. When I decided I had to write a video about this, I really did just sit there with my brain smoking, basically on fire like the fans didn't kick on. Seven overseers. They're even color-coded. They each have a key of authority. 
They were created by a detached and unfeeling god who is using their planet as a research project that never ends because, as the nature of a god seeking perfection, the subjects are never perfect enough. An endless samsara and an entire civilization being wiped out, only to be seated again in another attempt that will have the same outcome. All under a fake sky that is also the barrier between that world and the Sea of Quanta. How can you give us a story like that and not expect us to draw parallels to Tevat? For a year at least, I've been talking about Griseo, the character who traveled in the Ark, and that I mentioned before as a possible identity for the Primordial One. Now that we know the full outcome of her story, I think it's less likely but still possible, only in the case that perhaps Tevat was one of the worlds she seeded life on and then moved on from. In that case, that makes the idea of an usurper who came from outside and manipulated Tevat to their own designs sound more... Well, that's exactly what Saw did to the world of Qinyin. Saw in the Abyss, Su in Paradise. Another familiar concept that comes up here is the use of the term Abyss to refer to a place that is at the bottom of the Sea of Quanta. The same video I mentioned earlier, I'll go ahead and link it, in the description goes into far more depth than these concepts than I have time for here. But worlds that are dying end up in the sea, then sink to the bottom and dissolve into data that the tree then eats up and reuses to birth new worlds. This has been a well-known in-game concept for a while, but I think this is the first time it was directly referred to as the Abyss. This isn't just a Genshin thing. There's a challenge mode in Honkai Impact 3rd called Abyss that is loosely suggested to take place in the Sea of Quanta, and it is absolutely where the concept of the same name in Genshin came from. The idea that Saw is and has been the deity presiding over the depths of the Abyss for anywhere between 50,000 and millions of years isn't that necessarily important in Honkai Impact 3rd's lore, but also kind of is if you care about the larger cosmogony. If, as we theorize, Tevat is in fact a microcosm of the larger universe by the shape of its world model, Ermensel's roots in the abyss like the imaginary tree, and that tree then upholding the world itself, then it stands to reason that there is indeed some kind of deity or overseer down there in the abyss. Perhaps the sinner that was teased in the Caribert quest fits this bill, but I guess we'll have to wait for Dane to show up again to get any chance at knowing for sure. Now, if we assume that this parallel between Tevat and Qi Ming is intentional, we might be able to learn something from another bit of archaic, easily lost to the winds of time, <laughs> lore about the flame chaser Su as well. In the previous era and beyond, Su, using his immense psychic abilities, was tasked with an important job known as Project Veluka. Already, out of any Honkai Impact 3rd character that isn't just a character whose design elements got brought over into Genshin, Su has among some of the most obvious connections to the world of Tibet. If Project Veluka sounds familiar, that's because the word Veluka is featured prominently in Sumeru. The word means sand, and it was given to this project because the task that was assigned to Su would be no less daunting than finding a single specific grain of sand within a desert. A cheat sheet of the other connections between Su and Genshin also come back to Sumeru. In fact, this connection is so strong and obvious that people were theorizing that the Dendro Archon would in fact be our long-awaited Su XP rumored in early leaks, but that turned out to be all Hatham. The reason for this is because one of Su's most notable achievements, the one that people remember the most when they go through the Honkai Impact 3rd story, is likely the fact that he's the master of a special bubble universe that he created himself. It's called the Seed of Sumeru. He accomplished this feat by using the second Divine Key, the Cosmic Juggernaut. Divine Keys were created from the cores of Hershers, giving normal humans a way to manipulate and gain access to their godlike powers. In Genshin terms, just imagine the kind of weapon that might be created from an Archon's Gnosis and you'll be pretty close. Cosmic Juggernaut was created from the core of the previous era's Hersher of the Void, and it allows the user to travel between worlds and manipulate space-time. It, uh, also happens to be a train. Yeah, that train. But that's another lore video all by itself. Su used the Seed of Sumeru as a base of operations. 
his secluded place of meditation where he could endlessly dig through the countless worlds in the Sea of Quanta. I think about this now and how sad the futility of his efforts were. When the previous era set up Project Veluca, they didn't know definitively about the imaginary tree, which is almost impossible to access, or the true function of the tree and the sea. You see, only civilizations that have already been pruned from the tree would have fallen into the Sea of Quanta. So, of course, Su never would have found a suitable world with an answer to their dilemma. He was doomed to fail from the start, despite his thousands upon thousands of years of silent vig vigilance. One of the most important and the most canon, most absolute connections between Su and the world of Tevak comes from his project that he had undertaken. When he reached the end of his capabilities and the world was on the pre precipice of another disaster, he forfeited his life and passed on the seat of Sumeru to Bianca Itagina, the Valkyrie known as Durandal. She was given the seat of Sumeru, along with information on the nearby and adjacent worlds that Sue thought were important and worth watching. While going through this data, Durandal's surrogate father figure and boss, Auto Apocalypse, was able to see a glimpse of Devalin soaring through the sky from above. This is basically irrefutable evidence that Sue knew about Tevat. He had looked into it before, and that also tells us something concerning, that Tevat is likely already in the Sea of Quanta. As I mentioned before, only worlds that were already pruned from the imaginary tree, worlds set for deletion, end up there by normal causes. I suppose it's not impossible that Sue had access to worlds still on the imaginary tree's branches, but the description of his task being specifically to search through the Sea of Quanta is what it is. However, all hope is not lost. There are several in-universe instances of bubble universes being saved from deletion. In most cases, ether anchors are used to stabilize the world and stop it from sinking, allowing it to continue to exist. Though, that's no guarantee that the Honkai and its disasters, or other disasters, won't continue to batter the world until its sentient civilization ends up purged anyway. At the very least, once anchored, the world won't just break apart and dissolve. Probably. There's a whole manga following Durandal and Rita Roseweiss, who is the basis for many of Lisa Minchi's design elements, including the lantern she summons, on their quest to save a bubble universe in this way. Aether anchors are small, hexagonal-shaped gems that resemble Hersher cores, but it's pretty interesting that something called an ether anchor is its it's what keeps a world in the Sea of Quanta from destabilizing and just now in Fontaine we got little hints via the all-devouring narwhal's description that something or someone is likely protecting Tibet from outside influence. An e ether? Ether anchor? <laughs> uh, yeah. One more thing. Ether anchors have another name. They may be colloquially simply called a pearl. Not like that isn't a thing we theory crafters have been trying to unravel in Genshin since day one or anything. Let's go out on a limb and say that the Genesis Pearl is in fact an ether anchor. The only purpose for someone to want it would be either to safeguard it or destroy it. And that would have terrible consequences for Tevat. Just think about that for a while. The Narcissencroy's apocalypse finally starts to look like a possibility. If you do think about it that way, you can imagine a cracked sky and all. The only area inside of Sue's Seat of Sumeru we've ever been directly shown contains a giant tree, and he rests at the root of it, meditating in his quest for other worlds. It's no surprise, then, that Sumeru in Genshin is described as the center of the world, and geographically, it is literally. This brings a whole new light to the suggestion that the literal physical location of Erminsul is in Sumeru as well, though there's still so much that we don't know about Erminsul. We've been to see the real deal, but that was through Nahida. Through other characters like Albedo, we know that the existence of Erminsul is a very real physical thing, as he claims to have seen the roots of it, which are inhabited by, you know, giant spiders. Definitely not looking forward to co that coming up in the future. Sue's signet is the Bodhi leaf, which is a reference to a leaf from the tree under which the Buddha attained enlightenment. 
Obviously, there are Sanskrit Buddhist references literally everywhere in Sumeru, just as there are in all of Sue's signets in the Elysian realm. When I played through Yoimiya's second character quest and Nahida handed us a leaf, I almost shouted because it's it's identical to the one that is equipable in the Elysian realm. It's Sue's signature item. Now, back to what I said before, a crystallized Bodhi leaf is what he gave to Durandal that contained information about important and noteworthy nearby worlds. The same data that allowed Auto Apocalypse to briefly glimpse Devalin. That leaf is a symbol of and means communication, which is what Nahida used it for. It's universal in both Tevat and Honkai Impact 3rd. Now, that's the bulk of Sue's lore and where it connects on the surface. Deeper than that still is a one-off conversation you can blink and miss with him in the Elysian Realm story. もう一人の僕が僕の観測を感知したからね。無限の可能性の中ではどんなことが起きても彼女Further corroborating the idea of the interactable Hoyoverse multiverse, this set up the encounter that would come much, much later in story, as we met the character Vita, who was Saw's clone and the vestige of what she was when she was a human millions of years prior. Vita's design is simply gender bent Sue. She even sports the same tattoo he does at the base of his throat. If I'm nitpicking color picking, her eyes are slightly more red than the pink of his, but the only time that we see his eyes open is in the manga, which is known for taking the occasional artistic liberty in small details. Anyway, I think it's impossible to deny. Hoyaverse wouldn't make those design choices accidentally or without intention. They're just too specific. This seems to further be propped up by the ending of this chapter in the story, as when Saw's body is destroyed, her consciousness left to linger and dissipate in the seat quanta, Vita takes her eyes, calling them the eyes of Bodhi. Now, when Su died, he sank into the bottom of the seat quanta. In the second key manga, he's depicted as meeting a consciousness there, where he assumes is the afterlife, which then challenges him to what appears to be a game of Wei Chi, or in Japanese, Go. For a very long time, this was the last that we saw of him. It's still possible that he met another deity or consciousness altogether, but as he was quite literally sinking into this abyss in the Sea of Quanta when he died, I think it's most likely that it was Saw, the deity in the abyss, who he encountered. He persists beyond death likely by merit of his unfathomably powerful psychic abilities. I think that Saw quite literally took his eyes, which he almost never opened. The reason for him doing this remains up for debate. Some think it was to keep this other evil self from peering into the world. Others surmise it's due to them being the most concentrated and focused part of his power. I imagine seeing countless worlds at once would be disorienting, right? It's like they were intrinsically linked somehow as alternate versions of each other, but that's just me digressing. I just think it's an important bit of narrative that we should all be aware of that there is this idea of a deity at the bottom of the abyss, and the idea that that deity can be defeated and effectively replaced. Su, in his spiritual form, now inhabits that space and is still able to affect the world of humans where his loved ones still live on, albeit with limitations. We shouldn't brush off the fact that the barriers between worlds and entire universes are sometimes breached in the case of Su meeting Saw and Saw hunting him across worlds in order to get his, her hands on his power likely specific to this world's iteration of him due to his metamorph surgery. 
The same with Welt Yang and Void Archives of Honkai Impact managing to cross over worlds into the universe of Honkai Star Rail, suggesting that it too is relatively close to Honkai Impact's world and Tevat's on the imaginary tree. Origin and Finality So, if we take what I've suggested and just assume that all of the connections are there and mean what I think they mean, what information does that suggest to us? This is the story it paints in my head. Tevat is a world trapped in Samsara by some greater being, who's using it for an unknown purpose. In the Deity Saw's case with the planet Chi Ming and its seven overseers, this was an attempt at creating a race of humans she saw fit to replace the people of Purusha, whose consciousness data she'd been watching over for millions of years. I have no reason to believe that Saw is the one who personally manipulated Tevat in this way, but she had her sky people vanguard combing the galaxy and the sea of Quanta, eating up worlds and spitting them out once they drained them dry of energy. However, I feel that there is a new and pretty spooky bit of evidence that suggests that Saw or something meant to be an XB of her really was involved with Tibet. Really, stick with me, this is where it gets really crazy. It's the wishes. It's all in the wishes. I mentioned briefly, and kind of just left it there, that the method through which she destroyed civilizations was using wishes. Her ability as a god of the Sea of Quanta allows her to manipulate the laws of the world. This is a pretty heavily harped on concept in Tevat. The laws of Tevat must be obeyed, else calamity comes down from on high. This comes in the form of the celestial nails in antiquity, via the primordial one. But the one who came after seems to deal primarily in prophecies as punishment, as both Orobashi and Ajiria were punished for their sins in this way. Though Saw has the ability to freely manipulate the laws of any world, she only chooses to interfere by manipulating wishes. This is because she knows how to manipulate humanity, and that any world she targets will inevitably drive itself into a frenzy of great progress, thus generating Honkai energy, which she can then use her sky people to harvest until the civilization manages to destroy itself, at which point she moves on. Okay, 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 let's back it up a little, right? We have a nearly all-powerful deity, at least by our standards, who gives people wishes that are meant to harvest energy for her, and she is known as the god in the abyss of the Sea of Quanta, the, the abyss, the... Honestly, I was kind of just on this, oh, this is all interesting, tentative connections train, until I actually sat down and wrote this, and it's kind of staggering. It's all right there. The visions, humanity's wishes that are taken from a sliver of an Archon, one of seven overseers' power, and returns to the Archon and by proxy Celestia, when a vision wielder's duty is done, the way the Abyss of Genshin acts almost like the Sea of Quanta, from being a corruptive force to being able to come surging out like a tsunami when calamities occur, it's making me lose my mind. Oh no, this is it. This is the forbidden knowledge. It all makes sense now. No wonder I'm losing it. <laughs> uh, anyway... I'm thinking on the idea of that being a doomed world. Possibly currently in decay in the Sea of Quanta, explaining how volatile the Abyss is, and how often it comes seeping into the cracks of the world, makes me think of how the almost glaringly obvious Genshin Easter Egg and Star Rail is pretty cool, but it made me feel nostalgic and sad. How did the Wind Glider end up there? Why? Obviously for a cool Easter Egg, but it's also so rare for Hoyoverse to do anything without intent. And I think that... The one true easter egg in Herda's collection, and the other one that's there, and what it means. Himiko's sword. The shards of a proud blade, wielded by a warrior who fell into imaginary space. Her body and blade never to be recovered, though some shards of it were found by the Honkai Impact third crew. These curios are relics of something long dead. Even the dialogue attached to the glider feels somewhat ominous and sad, as if a remembrance of something that is no more. If I had to boil down my thoughts on this into a theory and lay it aside my heavy-handed words, it's this. Tevat is sinking in the Sea of Quanta. This is possible as all worlds in the Hoyoverse are attached to the imaginary tree. 
This means all worlds can wither as leaves and fall into that sea. That's not a stretch simply on technicality alone. Whether or not it's currently sinking or not depends on whether or not someone has st stabilized it with an ether anchor. A pearl, perhaps, a Genesis pearl to be exact. And if we assume the twins are in fact the siblings in the Battle Pass story, that makes Ether the, well, the one tasked with finding the pearl. It's also not lost on me that his name is Ether, literally. That makes me think about the Descender's remains and whether or not the true nature of the Genesis Pearl has been right under our noses all along, just split into pieces. There's also the fact that one of the newest characters introduced in Honkai Impact 3rd, only just barely teased at this point, Senadina, bears the title Deep Space Anchor and calls herself the Cocoon of Unraveling. She also brought up worlds being project protected by the constellations of the Zodiac, and that's the first time constellations have ever really been mentioned in the main story of Honkai. Really? Every day I think the answer to all of these questions is getting closer, one step at a time. If Senadina turns out to be some kind of living ether anchor, I'm probably going to expire on the spot. Just like in Qiming, the sky in Tevat is fake. A barrier like a glass ball that keeps out whatever is outside, likely the Sea of Quanta. We now know that multiple civilizations referred to the Honkai from within the Sea of Quanta as the Abyss, the Sugars, and the Perushians, which makes me feel like my theory that Honkai and Genshin's Abyss being one and the same is not far off the mark. And even taking all of this into account, it keeps the Gnostic world model intact. Erminsul, mirroring Su's seat of Samaru, remains the central pillar of the world. I now draw your attention to the heavenly principles and the primordial one before them. The celestial nails raised civilizations to the ground, but were deployed in order to stabilize the land. A world in the Sea of Quantum can be easily destroyed and harvested for energy by breaking its natural laws. This was heavily focused on in the storyline of the chapter At the Fingertip of the Sea in Honkai Impact 3rd. Could the reason the Heavenly Principles so viciously uphold Tevat's laws be for this very reason, that it is fragile? Bonus theory in bite-sized form because this video is getting too long for me already. Alice, the one person to ever suggest that they in fact are capable of traveling between worlds and may or may not protect the border of Tevat, is very similar in personality and intent to Elysia, the original Hersher. She sacrificed herself in order to give us a chance to fight against Honkai, rather than being slaves to it. Also, she's one of only two characters in Honkai Impact to have ears just like Klee's, so I don't think it's a stretch to assume that when we finally meet her, she'll have design elements in common with Elysia. I think that our biggest answers about the borders of Tevat, about the world outside of Tevat, will come with Alice. The Cocoon of Finality, the original Abyss. It's now in Kiana Kaslana's control. And while Saw is defeated in Hong Kong Impact 3rd, we have no idea how that timeline works in between worlds, or when Tevat is on that shared timeline. All speculation aside, only time will tell. I absolutely love the way Hoyoverse drew so many parallels to Tevat in this newest chapter of the Hong Kong Impact 3rd story. I have no doubt in my mind now, more than ever, that the two worlds will converge somehow, sometime, even if it's in a way that we would never expect. Thank you as always for watching, and if you made it this far, please take a minute to check out the links in the description, and consider supporting the channel so I can keep making content at a reasonable pace. Follow me on Twitter for bite-sized lore and frequent updates and, uh, bad dad jokes. This is, as always, the Hexen Circle signing off. I hope you'll join us on our next adventure.